Hello, everyone. Welcome to session one of this training course. Today, we are going to introduce motor and inverter theory to get everyone on the same page and to show at a simple level what has to happen to produce mechanical rotation in a motor. These concepts will help reveal the purpose behind some of the parameters the Moby Drive requires to operate a motor properly. Let's start by discussing how a motor works. Here we have a simple physics experiment with a horseshoe magnet, a piece of wire, and a battery. For the experiment to work, it would need to be a battery that can produce a fair amount of current, like a car battery. When we connect these pieces like shown in the picture, we can cause the wire to flex up or down. The direction the wire moves depends on the north and south polarity of the magnet and how the ends of the wire are connected to the positive and negative terminals of the battery. If we swap the polarity of the battery, we can cause the wire to flex in the opposite direction. Because we have caused the original direction of current flow to reverse, let's watch that a couple more times. This produced movement of the wire is called the motor effect. This is the basis of all electric motors where we can produce mechanical motion by manipulating the properties of two magnetic fields that intersect with each other. Now, if we want to produce rotation, which will be a lot more useful, we have to change our experiment. We'll take the wire and bend it in a loop the whole loop needs to be inside the horseshoe magnetic field. Doing this results in two opposite current flows in the same magnetic field. So one direction of current will push the loop down, and the other direction of current will push the loop up. These forces produce torque because the loop is wanting to rotate. The loop will rotate to almost the midway point of a full rotation, but a problem has presented itself causing the rotation to stop. The loop's current flow direction with respect to the horseshoe magnet has now flipped, which causes the forces to flip. So the loop returns to where it started. After a few seconds, the loop will keep doing this back and forth rotation. Eventually, the wire will settle and start vibrating near the vertical position. This isn't that useful either, but we can improve on this experiment. To fix this problem with not being able to create a full rotation, we need to add a device that will reverse the current flow every half turn of the wire loop. This is called a split ring, which is a ring cut down the middle, and it will keep the current flow in the same direction as the loop rotates. We need to conduct electricity to the ring, so we have to add these graphite cylinders called brushes. The brushes slide against the ring so that the wires connecting to the power source don't twist and break off as the loop rotates. This is the basis for a simple brushed DC motor that's really common in toys and battery operated small electronics. Now a DC motor is a direct current motor, so the current is always flowing in the same direction out of the power supply, but this type of motor isn't that common in the industrial sector. The motor that is more commonly used in the industrial sector are AC motors, or alternating current motors. These motors can be connected directly to the power supplies and have a lot of advantages over DC motors. AC motors are a lot simpler in their construction than DC motors, which makes them cost less and easier to maintain. DC motors require brushes, which is a wear component that requires periodic replacement. AC motors don't use brushes, 
so they don't have to be regularly disassembled for maintenance. AC motors have a wide range of horsepower sizes, and they are often smaller than DC motors of the same power rating. With that wide range of horsepower, AC motors presently are very efficient, often 90% efficient. So there is not as much energy wasted to thermal or mechanical losses. The efficiency ratings get better as the horsepower size increases because larger AC motors are generally more efficient than smaller ones. Our AC motors follow a modular portfolio, so we can add encoders, different shaft sizes, different flanges, mechanical brakes, so there is a lot of flexibility to meet different needs. AC motors can be manufactured to operate on single or three-phase voltage and have multiple different voltage ratings depending on the design and how it's wired. The vast majority of AC motors sold in the world today are the induction motor variety. Another common name for this type of motor is called a squirrel cage motor. If you took one of our AC induction motors apart, this is what it would look like. The stator contains coils of wire that loop in a specific pattern to produce a magnetic field. Those stator coils are assembled into a housing that keeps the coils stationary. The reason it's called a stator is quite simple. It's because this is the portion of the motor that remains stationary. The rotor is a laminated core of bars attached to a shaft which transmits torque to something outside of the motor housing, like a gearbox, pulley, or sprocket. The front and back sides of the motor are called the end shields. They house the bearings to support the shaft, and both ends have seals which protect the stator core from foreign materials entering, like gearbox oil or small particles. The A side is the side of the motor that is usually flanged and attached to the gearbox. The B side is the back side of the motor where the accessories are located, like brakes or encoders. The conduit box is what houses any electrical connections that need to be made at the motor. And the terminal block is where the connections are made to the power supply or inverter. These terminals always follow a specific wiring diagram that matches the winding pattern of the stator. Two motors can appear to be identical, but could have different terminal block diagrams if the winding patterns are different. The motor nameplate will always have a reference to the correct diagram. The rotor of the motor looks like a solid piece of metal, but it's not. If we were able to see inside, we would see this type of construction. In the previous slide, I said the rotor is laminated. The process to laminate the rotor is done by taking thin sheets of steel with holes cut in them and stacking them together. Then a shaft is inserted through the center of the stack. Molten aluminum is then poured over the steel stacks and fills the holes, which then harden into these straight bars. The bars are connected by these rings at both ends that short circuit them together, creating a coil made from cast aluminum. AC induction motors are called squirrel cage motors because the rotor is designed similar to a hamster wheel. Now the stator contains a core that is made in a similar way by bonding stacked sheets of steel together. The core's purpose is to be a heat sink, to provide slots for the coils to route through, and to give rigidity so the coils can't separate when the magnetic field is present. There are usually three separate coils of fine wire that create an electromagnetic field when the stator is energized. These coils are separated by the stator's insulation, which consists of slot liners, phase separators, and varnish on the strands of wire that protect from short circuits and to give the motor higher thermal capacity. This is the reason why the motor's maximum thermal rating and the correct wiring diagram need to be followed. If the motor's insulation is compromised, it can cause shorts of these coils phase to phase or phase to ground, which would require the motor to be replaced.
The way an AC motor can work without having brushes is by creating a rotating magnetic field. This was invented in the late 1800s, and the early designs created the magnetic field by connecting each coil of the stator to different power supplies. Around the world today, three-phase power supplies are abundant and most of the motors we sell today are going to be designed to be used with three-phase AC power. To simplify three-phase AC power, we can think of it as three individual power supplies that output three separate sine waves that are shifted in time from each other. What makes three-phase useful in the industrial sector is that when one phase of the power supply is trending down, another one is trending up. So the combined voltage never drops to zero volts, so constant energy is always available. Having three separate coils on the motor will create six different magnetic poles. The poles are labeled using the alphabet and numbers to keep track of them. A1 and A2 are the north and south pole of the first coil. B1 and B2 are the north and south pole of the second coil. And C1 and C2 are the poles of the third coil. When a three phase power supply is connected to these coils, the magnetic fields add together and cause the field to point in a specific direction. As the sine waves of the power supply cycle, the magnetic field changes the direction it points in. And it rotates inside the motor in time with a power supply. So this is why it's called a rotating magnetic field. To produce rotation, we take the motor stator and then insert the rotor and its squirrel cage design inside of it. As the magnetic field of the stator rotates around, a current is induced into the aluminum bars of the rotor. As the current flows through the bars, the rotor becomes magnetized. So we get a north-south magnetic field of the stator and a north-south magnetic field of the rotor. The stator and rotor have opposite magnetic fields, so they attract. As the stator field turns, the rotor follows behind it. And this is what produces the mechanical motion by these two magnetic fields pulling on each other. So this is the basics of an AC induction motor. We're working our way to inverter theory, and the next thing we have to answer is how do we determine the speed of a motor? In the United States, our power companies supply us with power that oscillates at a frequency of 60 cycles per second. So this is 60 hertz. In Europe and a lot of other countries, they have decided to use 50 hertz power. If our power cycles 60 times every second, then the magnetic field of the stator is going to go around once every cycle. So knowing this, we can calculate how many cycles will happen in a minute. We can do that by multiplying 60 cycles per second to 60 seconds per minute, which results in 3,600 cycles per minute. So we can say that the magnetic field inside the motor is turning at 3,600 rotations per minute. This result is called the synchronous speed. It's called the synchronous speed because the magnetic field of the stator is in sync with the frequency of the power supply. If we took this same motor over to Europe and connected it to the power supplies there, the motor's synchronous speed wouldn't be 3600 RPM, but would be 3000 because they're supplying 50 Hertz. When we build a motor, we can vary the number of poles it has. In this image, we have a two pole motor. Now you may see six magnetic poles in this image here, 
and be confused, but this is correct. The motor's pole count represents how many pole pairs there are per power phase. So it's a three phase motor and two poles per phase gives us six different magnetic poles. Magnets always have a north and south pole, so there will always be two fields present. If we wind the stator core to have more poles, it will look like this, which is a four poles per phase motor. The magnetic field will take more time to go around this four pole stator versus the two pole stator. So this motor by design will turn slower because it has to work through twice as many poles. The magnetic field of a two pole stator will rotate at 3600 RPM and the magnetic field of a four pole stator will rotate at 1800 RPM. As we increase the number of poles per phase of the motor, the synchronous speed will slow down. SCW sells two, four, six, and eight pole motors. So each one of those will have different synchronous speeds if we used the same 60 Hertz power for each one. Now with AC induction motors, you may make the assumption that if the magnetic field is rotating at 3600 RPM, that the rotor is turning at 3600 RPM because they are tied magnetically, but that's not the case. Usually the rotor is turning about 5% slower because the rotor lags behind the stator field just slightly. Induction motors are made by having a non-equal quantity of rotor bars and stator slots to prevent a magnetic lock between the stator and the rotor. This is actually necessary for the induction motor to work. If it wasn't designed in this way, the motor couldn't even operate. We call this lag behind the synchronous speed slip. If we calculated the slip of a 3600 RPM synchronous speed motor, we would result in an actual rotor speed around 3450 RPM. This slip speed will vary between different size motors and different efficiency ratings. The slip ratings are listed in our catalogs and motor data sheets. The rated speed that we print on the nameplate is actually the slip speed and not the synchronous speed. This is why motors that have slip are called asynchronous because their rotors don't turn at the synchronous speed of the magnetic field and they are designed that way. Let's bring what we've learned so far all together. Remember, the original question was, what speed does the motor rotate at? Two things determine what speed the motor rotates at, which are what frequency the motor is supplied with and how many pole pairs are in the stator. With this equation, if we know those two properties, we can calculate what the motor's synchronous speed will be. If you're wondering where this 120 number came from, this is a constant value. It is to convert seconds into minutes for the frequency and to convert the number of magnetic poles into pole pairs. So the equation is 120 multiplied by the power frequency divided by the number of stator pole pairs. For example, in the United States, a four pole motor's synchronous speed is 1800 RPM and an eight pole motor is 900 RPM. If we took the same motor and operated it in Europe, its four pole synchronous speed would be 1500 RPM and its eight pole speed would be 750 RPM. We would still need to look into the catalog or on the motor nameplate to determine the amount of slip so we can get an estimate of the actual shaft speed. This is called running a motor across the line, which means it's just connected to a three-phase power supply and there aren't any VFDs controlling it.
This is still a very common way to operate an AC induction motor. There's an alternative to the AC induction motor. It's called a synchronous servo motor. SCW makes these as well, and this is a cutaway of one. This is a specialty motor that is really great at precision motion and start and stop applications that need a lot of startup torque or high cycling speeds. These are different than induction motors because they use similar wound coils in the stator, but the rotor has these really strong magnets glued to it instead of a squirrel cage design. Because a magnetic field doesn't have to be generated in the rotor, these motors do operate at a synchronous speed because they don't have slip. These motors are also different because they can't be connected directly to a power supply. They must be connected to a VFD that is capable to operate a permanent magnet motor. These are pictures of some motor rotors from stock. One of them is for an AC induction motor and the other is for the permanent magnet servo motor. The motors that these rotors would be installed in have similar output torques but the rotors do have a significant size and mass difference. Servo motors can generate a lot of torque in a smaller design package. So if we compared an induction motor to a permanent magnet motor that produced the same amount of torque, we will find that the servo will be smaller. Because the servo motor rotor is much lighter than the induction motor rotor, it will be more dynamic, which means it can change direction or acceleration faster. The servo motor can produce almost 300% of its rated torque for a few seconds, which is more than double the peak torque of an equivalent induction motor. The applications that you'll find servo motors on are precision positioning tasks and applications that need to accelerate very quickly and be very dynamic. Now this doesn't mean that the servo motor is always better than an induction motor. Servo motors aren't suited for every application. This is especially the case in applications that have high inertia. Since the rotor shaft mass of a servo is a lot smaller, it can be difficult for the VFD to accurately control it if the application has a load inertia that is a lot higher than the rotor inertia. These are points that have to be discussed in the project planning phase for an application to determine which type motor would be better suited. Now we've reached the point for what this training course is centered around, which is VFDs. I've already been using this acronym so far, but it stands for variable frequency drives. The vast majority of what VFDs are used for in the world is to control motor speed. Alternatively, VFDs can be used to operate the motor at a constant torque. An example application that would require a specific torque would be a winding application for paper. If only the speed was controlled, the paper can tear or wind loosely because the diameter of the roll is always changing. Some VFDs have the ability to directly control the torque of a motor and keep it constant so the roll always exerts a specific torque and the product isn't damaged as the roll unwinds or winds up. Some VFDs can be used for positioning. Instead of just switching motor power on and off and controlling the speed, the VFD can monitor devices and command the motor to stop once a specific position of the machine has been reached. The more advanced VFDs like our MobiDrive can evaluate multiple feedback types and can have accuracies to tenths of millimeters or degrees of rotation, depending on how it's configured. We also call VFDs inverters, which means the same thing. And I'll be using both of these terms interchangeably throughout the training course. Sometimes VFD is shortened to just drives, which would mean the same thing as well. Let's now discuss what is happening inside a VFD. A VFD works by receiving a compatible AC line-in supply. 
This can be single phase or three phase, depending on the VFD's requirements. Our Movie Drive Inverter operates on a three phase supply, so our examples in this training course will be based on that type of supply. That AC supply gets internally routed to a rectifier. Remember, three phase AC can be thought of as three individual power supplies, so the rectifier only takes the top half of each AC phase and converts each one to DC. These voltages are added together in the circuitry to produce a somewhat steady DC level. The DC level isn't smooth though, so it goes through some filters to have capacitors and inductors to clean up the quality of the supply. What results is a voltage that looks like this out of the filters. This is called the DC link, or another term is the DC bus. This is a high voltage DC that is 1.4 times larger than the input AC voltage. An example would be a common AC voltage in the US of 480 volts. That would result in a DC link voltage that is steady around 700 volts. Our Mobi Drive Inverter has external terminals that are directly linked to the DC supply. So you do have to be extremely careful when working with our VFD because there are voltages present that are much larger than the input voltage. Also, those capacitors act like batteries and can hold a dangerous level for several minutes after power is removed. Always do your proper voltage measurements on the terminals before touching anything. To make this DC voltage useful, it is routed to IGBTs, which is an acronym for Insulated Gate Bipolar Transistors. This can be simplified as a high-speed electronic switch that can carry a lot of amps. There's a microcontroller to command the switching of the transistors in a specific timing and sequence pattern. The output of the transistors will look like this, which can be called a synthetic or simulated AC output voltage that has positive and negative peaks, just like a normal AC supply. When the motor sees this, it will behave just like it was powered by a normal AC supply. Let's dive deeper into how that synthetic AC voltage is created. It is by a technology called Pulse Width Modulation, or PWM as the acronym. PWM is a way to switch DC voltage on and off. The transistors can't vary the voltage level, so its only options are to be full DC voltage or no DC voltage. And we can summarize its operation in three different cases. The first case is the transistor being mostly off. This means it would be on for a short time, off for a much longer time, shortly on again, then off for a much longer time. This will keep happening over and over. The second case is equally on and off. This means it's on half of the time and off the other half of the time. The third case is mostly on, where it's on for the majority of the time and off for brief intervals. What we can notice about this is that there are two on and two off pulses for each case. What makes these cases different are the duration of each on and off period. This difference in on and off time is called the duty cycle. Now the speed or rate at which the transistor is switched on and off is fixed, and that is called the modulation frequency. This ranges between four kilohertz to 16 kilohertz. Remember, the unit hertz is the number of cycles per second. So this fixed range is 4,000 to 16,000 cycles per second of the transistors. In a quiet classroom setting, this is something that is noticeable because the Moby Drive parameters default to a low modulation of four kilohertz, which has an audible sound like automotive brake pads squealing. 
So one of the things we'll have to do in our lab activities is increase our modulation frequency so the audible noise is reduced. The Moby Drive parameters have step selections of 4, 8, 12, or 16 kilohertz. So the transistors and microcontroller are adjusting the width of the on and off pulses, but when a motor is connected to a VFD, it doesn't see the individual pulses coming out. It thinks it's getting a normal AC sine wave that is oscillating up and down. Let's visualize this again with the previous examples. If it is mostly off, it looks like a low voltage. If it is equally on and off, it looks like a medium voltage. And if it's mostly on, it looks like a high voltage. So the motor is seeing a sine wave from 0 volts to 480 volts, then down to negative 480 volts, then back up again. So by pulsing the DC, we can make the motor operate like it's on AC. So far, we've explained how the PWM can make pulsed DC appear to be AC voltage, but how can we control the speed of the motor too? Well, the timing at which the synthetic AC sine wave oscillates is adjustable. This can range from zero hertz, meaning the motor is at standstill, to hundreds of hertz, which is way faster than any standard across the line power supply available in an industrial plant. The frequency the motor sees is increased just by making the sine wave oscillation cycle from zero to 480 to negative 480 and back to zero happen in less time. There's a neat trick that is only possible with VFDs and SW calls this supercharging or super driving. This is where a 50 or 60 Hertz rated motor is operated at a frequency faster than its nameplate rating, up to say 100 or 120 hertz. This is common in applications that need a very wide speed range and standard speed control up to 60 hertz isn't enough. For example, older applications before VFD technology existed used mechanically variable ratio gearboxes to alter the output speed. Those style gearboxes aren't commonly available now, so they are being upgraded to a fixed ratio gearbox with a motor and a VFD. To cover the same speed range of those old variable gearboxes, the motor would need to operate faster than its nameplate rating of 60 Hertz. Superdriving above the motor rating of 60 Hertz isn't possible with every combination of VFD and motor. A VFD with the proper voltage and horsepower has to be selected and the mechanics of the gear motor have to be calculated at that increased speed to make sure it's okay for continuous operation. I said previously the VFDs can operate up to hundreds of hertz, but there is a frequency limit to inverters, not because of hardware limits, but because laws require it. This is about 10 times the frequency of a standard power supply. So if an 1800 RPM motor was operated at 599 Hertz, it would be running around 18,000 RPM. These laws are in effect because at these speeds, centrifuges could be made to enrich uranium and be used to make nuclear weapons. So all inverters have to be limited below this frequency. The majority of applications around the world won't need frequencies anywhere close to this limit, so having this limit isn't a hindrance in the industrial sector, but it's something interesting to note. Let's discuss another relationship with VFD control that is important to know. The motor torque is dependent on how many amps are flowing through the windings, but there's a little problem with producing current in a motor. As we increase the frequency of the motor to make the shaft turn faster, the motor windings actually start to oppose current flow. So the higher the frequency we command, the lower the current wants to be. 
If the current goes down, then our output torque is also going down. This isn't very useful because we want the motor to deliver maximum rated torque at its maximum rated speed. So we have to compensate for the current dropping by steadily increasing the voltage in the motor as the frequency increases. If we steadily increase the voltage in the windings, then we can maintain a somewhat constant current in the motor, which will keep the motor delivering constant torque through the speed range. This volts and frequency curve starts from zero and goes to 460 volts. Once the voltage reaches 460, the output frequency needs to be around 60 hertz. The reason the voltage stops at 460 is because the VFD can't output more voltage than the AC line input voltage. Now you may be wondering if we're sticking to this linear VF curve, how can super driving cause a motor to get to 100 or 120 hertz with constant torque? Well, one of the tricks to super driving is to wire the motor stator for its low voltage rating. If we did that, then the motor would need to be at 230 volts at 60 hertz for constant torque. Since super driving only works on 460 volt inverters, we still have more voltage to use for the higher frequencies. If we keep the VF curve linear, then the top end for super driving would be around 460 volts at 120 hertz. Super driving does need a lot of current to keep the torque constant. So the VFD usually needs to be twice the horsepower rating of the motor. For example, a five horsepower motor would need a 10 horsepower VFD to superdrive it. All VFDs of any manufacturer have some sort of VF control mode like this. This is fairly low tech motor speed control and the most basic way a VFD will run a motor. Now this transitions us into some more complex speed control methods possible with our VFDs. If you have a simple VFD, it is operating in what is called open loop control. When you program a VFD to run the motor at a specific speed, that is called a set point. Open loop means that the VFD has calculated what frequency and voltage is needed to reach the desired set point. But after the VFD outputs that VF curve, it doesn't have confirmation to know what the actual speed of the motor is. Some VFDs aren't completely in the dark about what the actual speed of the motor is though. They can monitor for fault conditions and measure the magnetic field of the motor to get an estimate of what the actual speed of the motor is. A lot of applications that use open loop control aren't speed critical. So a fluctuation of a few RPM here and there isn't a big deal. This VFD pictured is our MobyTrack LT series, which we sell a lot of for open loop control. It's very simple to set up and it doesn't have an overwhelming amount of parameters. So it's useful in many types of applications. If you need critical speed control or positioning capability, that will need to be closed loop control. This is only possible with more advanced VFDs like our MobyDrive. This control method works by the inverter still sending a VF curve relationship to the motor, but it also receives actual speed feedback from a sensor on the motor shaft. These sensors can be very precise, so the VFD will be continuously fluctuating the VF curve to adjust for the actual speed of the motor to maintain that set point or position with high accuracy. In most applications, whether they are open loop or closed loop, there is likely some type of change happening that the VFD will need to account for and adjust when needed. For example, let's say the VFD is controlling a conveyor belt and it's moving along and there isn't anything on the belt. So when there's nothing on the belt, the torque required from the motor is low. But as soon as a heavy package is placed on the belt, the load changes immediately, which will require a lot more torque from the motor to keep the belt moving at the set point speed. In an ideal world, the VFD would respond immediately with a load change, 
but in a real world with real applications, that isn't possible. So there's this brief time delay for the VFD to respond to the new torque requirement. Once the VFD calculates what changes it needs to apply, it then sends the adjustments to the motor. After the VFD makes its first adjustments, the torque in the motor oscillates around what is actually required by the load. This oscillation is called overshoot and undershoot because it takes time for the VFD's controller to measure what torque is actually needed. After a short while, the oscillations will settle and the torque will remain consistent until another load or set point change event happens in the application. How well the VFD responds to changes in the application depends on the type of VFD and how it's commissioned for the application. For example, if you have a simple VFD and it only has VF mode, this is what the response will look like. It's somewhat sloppy and takes a while for the speed control to settle to a consistent level, but it works. With our products, VF mode is always open loop. Even if we were using our Moby Drive with a motor encoder, if the VFD is commissioned for VF mode, the encoder signal is ignored. However, many of our VFDs have a second mode called VFC mode. This is an acronym for voltage flux control. Some other manufacturers probably call it vector control, and the principles on how it operates are similar to our VFC mode. This mode is more sophisticated than simple VF mode, and you can see the delay time and oscillations are less when the VFD sends adjustments. VFC mode with our products can be used in open or closed loop control. If VFC is ran in open loop, it's a way of getting really decent speed control without an encoder but it can be used with an encoder in closed loop control and the accuracy will be even better for speed and positioning. A third mode that is only available with our advanced VFDs like the Moby Drive is CFC mode, which is an acronym for current flux control. This mode only works in closed loop control with encoder feedback, so that's why it's limited to our advanced VFDs. This mode will give the best control response and accuracy when load or set point changes happen in an application. This mode is really useful for dynamic applications that have a lot of changes or positioning applications that need precision. There is a rule with CFC mode and that is it only works with our motors. The reason for that is we have a mathematical model for each motor we manufacture that get programmed into the Moby drive during commissioning to be able to directly control the current of the motor. We don't have that type of detail for non-SEW motors, so it's not possible to operate those in this mode. However, if you happen to have a non-SEW motor, then VFC mode will work great for that, and our advanced VFDs can monitor several different types of encoder signals, so there's a lot of flexibility when using our VFD with non-SEW motors. This training course is dedicated to our Moby Drive B product, but we do sell other types of VFDs you may find in your electrical cabinets, and I want to mention some of those to you. I briefly mentioned it in a previous slide, but the MobyTrack LT product is our most simple VFD. The LTE version is great for pumps, fans, and simple speed control applications, and has a very minimal parameter set, so it's easy to commission. The LTP is a step above the LTE in its parameter options and motor control algorithm. The LTP can handle more dynamic open loop applications like hoists and applications that may need customizable digital inputs and outputs. The next version up is our MobyTrack B, which is based on the MobyDrive B platform. The MobyTrack B parameters are almost the same as the MobyDrive B. The biggest difference between the MobyTrack and the MobyDrive is that it can't operate in CFC mode because it can't have high resolution encoder feedback. The MobyTrack B is really great for applications that are open loop but need to be on a field bus 
or need its inputs and outputs routed to a PLC to control it. We have some new product that has been released over the past year that is available alongside our MobiDrive B. The MobiDrive technology, system, and modular are part of our Movi C generation, and these VFDs expand on the capabilities of the MobiDrive B. This new generation of VFDs also upgrades our ability to support multi-axis control applications with these modular access modules connected to a single power supply. These type VFDs are really useful for complex and precision control applications like robots and storage retrieval systems. The controller is the red box off to the left where an IC program can be loaded to it and customized for whatever the application requirements are. This training series won't cover anything for this new generation of product, but we do have separate training classes on this product if it is something that you will be working with. All right, we have reached the end of our first session. In this session, we taught the basics of motor and inverter theory and the terminology that goes along with it. We discussed how torque is produced in a motor and what types of control modes can be found in SCW VFDs. Finally, we introduced the topic of speed control response and how the control mode affects the accuracy of the motor's torque or speed control. In the next session, we will get specific with the MobiDrive B VFD and discuss the types of motors it can control, the horsepower size ranges, its features, and options that it can support. Thank you for your attention. Take care and have a good day.